a moment, just a moment, in our service of worship to the Lord, where I sensed and I felt that heaven was extended to us. In other words, it was likened to the fact that we were in the presence in the throne room of God. But I know you were here. So it's likened to the fact that God's presence was extended to you in this room. There was another occasion in the scripture that I'd like to mention to you this morning. And that was after Jesus spent 40 days and showed himself to over 500 people and the followers of Jesus gathered with him on the Mount of Olives. And as they were in the presence of Jesus and he began to ascend to heaven, that was a moment of awe. I wanna tell you church, no one was asleep there. Nobody was texting other people and nobody was on their cell phone wondering what was happening in social media. There was an awe moment when our Savior Jesus was ascending to heaven. And as they began to see him rise, and ascend beyond the clouds and somewhat disappear. Every time I see a helium balloon or a balloon filled with helium rising into the sky and it kind of disappears in the distance, it's a reminder to me of what it was like when Jesus ascended into the heavens. And I want you to know on the planet, that was a moment of awe. These disciples were enraptured with Jesus, even though he was disappearing from their eyesight, their hearts were caught up to his presence. I want you to lift your hands right now and just let's together stand in awe of Almighty God today. Remembering He's your Father this morning, your Heavenly Father, the best example of fatherhood you could ever imagine. And we get to cuddle up to him today. Lift your voices. Let's begin to just audibly thank him for his fatherhoodness to us today.
And Lord, that's the way we feel this morning. We stand in awe of you. Your goodness chases us down. Your love draws us into your presence. And it pulls worship out of our being as we stand in awe of your very presence. Even in this morning. And give all praise because you're absolutely worthy of our praise today. Can anybody say amen? Amen. Awesome. Go ahead, be seated. I don't want you to lose sight of the fact that in this room is the very presence of the Father extended by the person of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is in this place. What a wonderful experience that is. Our God is the Father of fathers. There's none like him. None like him. Today is Father's Day, and we are here to recognize fathers, and we're going to be praying for fathers a little later on in this service, every single father. We're going to be praying for you, so don't run out. Don't get carried away. We're going to need you to stay in the moment. We're going to pray for you. Actually, we have a very busy, busy week here, and uh, I'm going to have several share on that. But before we get to that, um, we want to do some Father's Day stuff here today. And uh, we have some awards for fathers today. Uh, every father sh should have been given a, uh, uh, a cap. Anybody missed? We all got one. Great. Awesome. Well, we're going to give some awards out here today to fathers. And uh, this award goes to the Methuselah father of the house. And that would be to the oldest father in this place. So can I get a read? How many here over 80 years of age? Put your hand up. Got a couple here over 80. Okay, we're going to have a runoff. I can see this. Anybody over 82? We do have an 82 older. Anybody older than 82? Okay, Mr. Gary, come on up here, Gary. You are the guy this morning. Well, Gary, you got to know a couple things. Once you get to your age, it doesn't really matter how old you are. As a matter of fact, you actually get honored for your extended years. So you got to tell us how old you are. 84. 84 years old. He's the oldest father in the house. God bless you, Gary. Let me hug on you. Awesome. God bless you. Okay. I know we're going to do a few other things, but here's what I need you to know. Uh, you can only get one gift, even though you may qualify for some others. All right? Number two gift today goes to the, uh, the newest father. Now, I'm going to make a statement on that one because we are a church that believes that conception occurs or fatherhood be, uh, occurs at conception. Did I get that right? We're a, we're a church that believes that. So we have a father, unless anybody knows anyone different than that, Nolan is about to be a father. Yeah. Come on down here, Nolan. Well, I, actually, we're inside of a month here. And uh, so about, he's going to be our youngest father.
father in the house. So Nolan, come. This is a very special honor to you, my friend. You're welcome. <laughs> awesome. Okay, I got one more award. And this is, you're going to have to do the math here, for the father, grandfather, grandfather who has the most grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Most children, gr uh, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Three categories. Children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Okay, we're going we're gonna to do a call down on this. Gary, you can't you win this. You already won something. Okay, so here we go. Anybody who is a grandfather who has children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, 20 and over, put your hand up. Ooh, okay. You got 20? You surprised me, Pete. Okay. You caught me off guard. All right. All right, let's, let's work this down. How many have 19 children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren total? 19. Okay, okay. He's got to stand up if that's you. Come on. 19. We've got people pointing. I'm not going to go and embarrass anybody, but if somebody has 19, Mr. Ford, come on up here. Bob Ford. Actually, I did not know that, Bob. I, me either. Yes, you did. This is a special award. What a heritage of children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Hand it to this guy. He's going to need a lot of prayer. All right. Awesome. Well, those are our Father's Day awards today. I told you that we're going to have a busy next season. Well, it's going to start this week. And um, I want... Uh, uh, Craig, to get ready here to come because on Friday of this week, we are going to be involved in a citywide music thing, and uh, I'm going to botch that announcement. Craig's going to do it correctly. So uh, on this week, we want your participation and support. Isn't that a wonderful looking hat you have? Awesome. Thanks. So a unique thing happened a couple weeks ago. Uh, somebody called me up and said, Craig, have you ever heard of the International or the World or something Music Day? And I said, no, I've never heard of that. And they said, well, we're celebrating it in Aberdeen, and we've seen the stream of your guys' church, and we want your church to come and celebrate Jesus in the midst of the International worship, oh, oh, Music Day. So there's going to be all this secular music going, and then we are going to be this, this like island of worship to Jesus. And interestingly enough, they gave us one of the main stages as well. They really honored this church, and they're very excited to have us. So I want, yeah, it's a cool thing. Yeah. By the way, a little side note on that. There is a YouTube video of one of our services that I think just went over 50,000 views, if you can imagine. And that was from about eight weeks ago. And so every once in a while, we, we get between 3,500 and 6,000 views every week on Facebook if you can imagine. And so it's just incredible. The, 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 the ministry is touching a lot of people. But anyway, they saw our videos and they saw our stream and said, we want Cornerstones worship. So we're going to go there. We're just going to be us. We're just going to worship Jesus with everything we got. And we want to invite you guys to come and join us. So it is Friday at 12 o'clock. Get this. Wait, Pete, what? 12.15. And where is it at? It's at the... Mount Olympus Brewery of all places. So let's go. I, I think Jesus would sing right there in front of the brewery. I just really do. But anyway, um, we're going to be uh, uh, 
<laughs> Sorry, I'm not trying to mess with anybody right now. I just am saying I'm excited that we are going to stand in front of the brewery and we are going to worship Jesus. And we're on one of the stages. So at Mount Olympus Brewery in downtown Aberdeen, I'm not exactly sure where that is, but it's down there somewhere. Find it and uh, come and join us. And so they're going to be doing an announcement on the main stage. We're one of the side stages. So the main stage, and then as soon as that announcement is done, our downbeat will start, and we have about an hour and 15 minutes where we get to worship Jesus. And so we're going to do that. So I'm excited about that. Yeah. Can I make one more announcement? Yeah, so uh, the, one other thing. It's been a little bit hit and miss, but watch Facebook because we're trying to stream all of Joel's football games. Um, uh, down here in the fire center room if we can. So if you want to go watch Joel play, it's not always easy to watch a stream from Canada. And I just want to let you guys know, if you watch Facebook, if we can get the stream going here, anytime we have a stream going here in the fire center room, sometimes we stream it, anybody's welcome. And so sometimes you'll see a little last minute Facebook post or whatever. We just want you all to know anybody's welcome to come down. Sometimes there's two people and sometimes there's 20 people. It just depends on who's available. But um, we just, if we can get it, I know a lot of people have asked. I just want people to know. And it's, in the CFL, it's different nights of the week. It could be a Thursday night, a Friday night, a Saturday night. There may even be a Sunday night game. I don't know. But it's different nights. And, and we don't know how, sometimes we have to do creative things to even be able to stream it. So it's kind of hard to get it. So we're still figuring all that out as well. It's, we have to do a virtual private network and pretend like we're in Toronto so that, you know, for the, the way the rules work on streaming stuff. So anyway, and we just start figuring all that out. So anyway, if you want to come down and want to watch the stream, you can always do that. If the game is going, reach out to me or somebody and watch Facebook and we'll post it if we get the stream going. All right? All right. Thanks, Dad. Sorry. Okay. Awesome. I know this, and I just want to say that uh, this next game will be in Toronto. I believe it's Saturday, isn't it? And then the next week, just so you know, the game is going to be in Vancouver on a Thursday, and there are a lot of people that are driving from here, catching the game, and then driving back. So keep that in mind, uh, just so that you can be in the know on all of that stuff. Okay, I did say a lot of things are happening. One thing is going to be happening. Our young people are going to be engaged in a youth camp. It's going to cost a ton of money to get these kids there. And I want to ask you to do something to sacrificially sponsor some of these young people. Um, 100 bucks, 50 bucks, 20 bucks. If your camp fee is around $350 and we have five, that's a lot of money. Or 10, how many know that's a lot of money for these kids to come up with? Uh, they're not always going to rely on sponsorship. Ben's going to come and help us understand what a fundraiser could look like with these kids. So we have our first fundraiser that's going to be coming up on the 29th. So not next Saturday, but the following. And next Sunday, we're going to come around. We'll sell some tickets for it. It's going to be a movie night that we're going to basically kind of treat it like a drive-in um, where you can come. You can uh, purchase having an entire car or you can get individual tickets and you'll be able to set up in the parking lot over on the side there, and we're just going to set up a movie. We'll sell popcorn and different snacks of that nature just so that we can get the kids involved and, and really kind of uh, putting in the work to achieve this goal and also having a, a service that we can provide to you guys. So that will be going on on the 29th. We'll have uh, next week we'll have another announcement about it, and we'll have tickets to sell and the whole nine yards. So, yeah, and then we will be having another one come up in July, another event, and as we kind of get past this first event, we'll let you guys know. So mark your calendars for Saturday the 29th. And mark your calendars for July the 4th. I mean, oh, 4th of July is a big deal, and we're going to have a church barbecue at 2 p.m. July 4th falls on a Thursday, and so working folk don't have a four or five-day weekend, all right? 
working folk only have one day off, and that's most of us. And so what's going to happen at 2 o'clock, we're going to do burgers and, and hot dogs. We'll probably have a um, uh, cornhole tournament and a lot of fun and fellowship on that time. Uh, we have a sign-up in the foyer so that as you come, no, we're going to bring the, we're going to furnish the, the burgers and the hot dogs, but you can bring side dishes and desserts, and so sign up accordingly. That's on the, in the hallway, and uh, check that out. That's July the 4th, and we are going to have fun that day. I want to remind you about giving, and uh, you can give to the work and ministry here at Cornerstone Church. You can give today by placing your tithes and your offerings in the offering box in the foyer you can mail text in and all those things uh thank you for what you do in that regard take your bibles would you please i would like to share with you what i would think is a very significant message for the house today at the end of this service, we're going to pray for all the dads in the room. But before we get there, I want to share with you the word of the Lord. So take your Bibles, turn to Psalms 127. I'm going to only read the first portion of this first verse. Psalms 127, verse 1. Scripture says, unless the Lord builds the house. Let me start again. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. This word house needs to be explained this morning. I've heard it used and I've even applied it myself to the building of the house of God, that is the church. Unless the Lord builds the church, we labor in vain. How many know that's a truth? Unless the Lord builds his house. Whereas, whereas that is true, it has another context that I want to unpack for you this morning. And since this verse is written in the Old Testament era and the church did not exist, proper at that time frame, I think we want to get a precise definition as to what the scripture means when it talks about the house. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. That context of the house is more purely the family unit. And I want to talk to you about family matters this morning because I believe it can be applied not only to the family of God, but it is precisely directed to the family unit. It's Father's Day. Today is Father's Day, and it fits the moment. Unless God is at the heart and building your family, things can go sideways real quickly. I want to make a statement, and I'm going to repeat it over and over again today so that you can get the drift of it. There is no pain like family pain. Stop and think about that for a moment. There is no pain like family pain. Again, unless the Lord builds the house, the house will be built in vain and the house will be filled with pain. Family life can be delightful. Yesterday we Sharon and I drove to Portland. We got to watch our little grandson play in all-star baseball, hung out with our family. It was delightful. 
It was fun to do. Family life can be dynamic if prioritized. But it is difficult and it is draining if it is neglected. I want to talk to you a little bit about that. If life is not working at home, it's just not working, period. No matter how successful we, we may be in other areas, in other places, and if our families are the biggest target of pain in our hearts, I want you to know this morning, our children are the bullseye. The enemy is targeting your children. This is true today. And it was true in Bible times as well. And I want to share with you the story of one of the most famous families in the Bible. I want to tell you the story, or some of the story, around King David's family, King David's life. We, we put King David on a pedestal, and rightly so. The Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. He's the one that introduced us to biblical worship. He was a worshiper par excellence. But if you look into David's life, he had a boatload of pain. And it started a lot with his rebellious son, Absalom. His life unfolds like a sordid soap opera. Absalom, David's own flesh and blood. Absalom murders his half-brother. Think about that going on in that family. He murders his half-brother as retribution for that half-brother raping his sister, Tamar. Already you can see there are big problems in David's family. Estranged from his father, Absalom then lent, leads a coup, and he turns on his dad, and he turns on his dad's most trusted advisor and gets this company of people to rise up against David. And not only that, he chases David off the throne and runs him out of Jerusalem. David waited in exile. Here we're talking the king now. The king is waiting in exile while the shattered remains of his army were out fighting his own son. Doesn't even make sense. David, at this point, doesn't care about the battle, the victory, or even his throne. What David wanted most desperately was to know whether Absalom, his son, was safe. Speak of dysfunction the very son who was trying to overthrow him, the son who would actually kill him if he had a chance. And when David finally learns that Absalom dies in the battle, I want you to see his reaction. Second Samuel chapter 18 and verse number 33 records it. He cries out these words when Absalom is taken out in the battle. He says, my son, my son Absalom, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you? Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. This is weird. 
It's unthinkable. David's enemy was his own flesh and blood. Can I say those we love the most are those to whom we are most vulnerable? The Bible makes no effort to sanitize the pain families can experience. It doesn't cover up the pain and anguish that humans experience in the journey of life. In fact, the scripture is full of examples of dysfunction. And we see here in this case, David's family is a family of dysfunction. Even though he's a man after God's own heart, even though he's the king of the Israelite people, his family was in shambles. And there are other examples. There's the family of Noah, of all people. Come on, church. Noah. He's the guy that builds the ark. He saves the human race. He's a man of faith. His family's in disarray. Let me tell you of another, Eli. Do you know who Eli was? Eli was the high priest of Israel, the Lord's priests. His sons were far from God. Not good, not good. Hosea, I remember Hosea in the Old Testament, God's chosen prophet. Read the story today. I don't have time to get into all the details, but these were major players in the Bible. And they were those who had major problems in their family dynamics. And of these stories, perhaps we can parallel our own lives and confirm that there's no pain like family pain. Even Christian homes find themselves upside down with problems, crippled by divorce. I'm not trying to pin this on anybody, just hear me out. We have problems, absentee parenting, financial distress that flows into the well-being of family units. So let me ask you a question with all of that backdrop. Is all hope lost? Well, church, this morning, I want to tell you emphatically, no, it is not lost at all. And that's what I want to focus on this morning. In the midst of biblical family dysfunction, and even in our own family dynamics that are greatly in need, you might be sitting in this place thinking to yourself, what's the point? What's the use? And I'm here to tell you that there's hope. And where does hope begin? Even in the midst of your family pain or dynamics, I want to confirm the fact that there is hope for each and every one of us. Very good place to say amen. So let me walk this out. Family matters, where we can find hope today. Anybody want hope for your life, for your family, for this church, for this community? I'm going to show you where the Bible shows us we can stand on the promise and the word and the hope that God gives us. So here's your first clue. We need to identify our problems. Can I say our problems as sin? The Bible uses that word. We skirt around it. We don't like the word. 
And so we call our issues all kinds of different names, but we rarely identify it as sin. And that's not how the Bible operates. The Bible goes to the heart of the matter and it directs us to the issue, and the issue is sin. My sin, my avoidance of the issue, my refusal to live according to Scripture, all that the Bible identifies as a gross error, and that gross error is a three-letter word called sin. Quite often, we're close to the grace of God for transformation because we don't call a spade a spade. We call it in, an indiscretion. We, we often avoid what God calls it, and that is iniquity. And when that happens, we forfeit his grace, and that's not a good place, church. We want to walk in the favor and in the grace of God. And in order to do that, we got to be real before God. How many know he knows everything about you? You can't hide behind a rock. That little trick that Adam pulled in the Garden of Eden didn't work. He hid himself. But God knew where he was. And he did the craziest thing you could imagine. He covered up his issue with a fig leaf. So we hide and we cover up. And we think God doesn't know. It's because we've reduced a holy God to our own logic. And we think he can only see what he can, we can see. It doesn't work like that with God, church. We've got to become very, very clear on what God's clear with. Sin is sin. So, first out of the gate, we need to identify our problem as sin. That's at the heart of major dysfunction in our family units. Let me give you the second. And it's good news, actually. God can transform your family. That's good news. God can reset your family. You might be thinking this morning, well, hey, there's so much water under this bridge. It's just not going to happen. Well, don't put limits on God, church. Our God can do amazing things. He can, he can turn your family around. The good news is your family pain can be healed if you're willing to acknowledge its source and deal with it God's way. He was always responsive when his people would take ownership for their sin, trusting him, and then giving ownership to God and him alone. God can reset. He can transform your family. This isn't going to be rocket science this morning. It's not going to be complicated. We just have to call a spade a spade in our life. Call what God calls sin, sin, and deal with it. And then believe that God can transform our family. And then I want to take it yet another step further. And that is 
in spite of everything that we have at our disposal today, only God can change your family. I know there's a lot of good things out there, but I want you to know, at the end of the day, it's only God who could change your family. Unless the Bible says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. Jimmy Evans has been imparting to a lot of couples and a lot of family dynamics and David and Brenda have been leading the marriage enrichment called uh, Marriage on the Rock. And in that series, and anything that Jimmy Evans does, which makes me a strong advocate of his ministry, is that he inserts God in the center. So if you have a marriage, and this is what I've been doing with couples getting married, we've been going through this four law, uh, laws of love, and one of the first things that comes out of the gate on that is that God is the center of the marriage. Quite often in our culture, we make the husband and the wife, that couple, united as the family dynamic or lead. Jimmy Evans changes that. And I'm going to show you why it's important to embrace the change. Jimmy Evans says, unless you have the husband and the wife and God in the center, you will always have problems in your marriage. God has to be at the center. The husband submits to the will and purpose of God. Like Wise. The wife submits to the will and purpose of God. God is at the helm of every marriage unit. God is at the center of every family dynamic. And when he is not at the center, you have all kinds of dysfunction. You have all kinds of problems. Because everybody's idea is better than the next person's idea. And so you have this battle of ideas. What are we going to do? Which way are we going to go? What decision are we going to make? At the end of the day, it's God's directive that's most important. And we've got to sort that out and find that. Let me again say, unless the Lord builds the house, and we're talking about the family unit now, unless the Lord builds the family unit, then those who labor in attempting to build a family dynamic will do so in vain. If you find yourself in that predicament today, I want you to remember this. Only God can change hearts. In the family dynamic, in the family marriage, with children, grandchildren, You've got to be a person of prayer because only God can change hearts. You can't change anybody's heart. You can't change your spouse's heart. You can't change your children's hearts. You can't change your grandchildren's hearts. Only God can change hearts. And unless you are linked in partnership with God, all our efforts to transform our family will fall short. But I want to tell you, if you are partnering with God, I'm going to give you the, the brightest spot of this morning. Your best days are ahead of you. If you partner with God, your best days are yet to come. I don't care what has happened behind you. It's time to partner with God. And when you partner with God, your families will rise. Your marriages will rise. 
spiritual well-being of your children and your grandchildren will rise. The question is, what is partnering with God look like? He's got to be dead center of why we exist. Whatever you might be going through, you need to daily take these matters up with God. You got to look at your prayer life. You got to look at your hunger for God. You got to look at how you apply yourself to the kingdom of God, to the house of the Lord. And when you do that and make him the priority of your life, you're going to be excited for your future. I want to say if you're a dad today, and I'm going to mix words here, but the full weight of the family falls on your shoulders. If you're a dad today, you can't shirk that responsibility. You can't pass it on to somebody else. Well, the wife, you take care of the kids. Wife, you do this. I'm going to be busy. The responsibilities fall squarely on our shoulders. So this is a good time to talk with God about seemingly insurmountable problems that might be in your family. So what would you like to see God heal or resurrect for you this morning? Think about it for just a second. What would you like to see God do in your family today? Okay, bring that to the Lord, would you? We're going to pray for each of you fathers, every dad present. But before we do, David's going to come and share with us a, um, a word of exhortation that might lead us into What trusting in God from another culture looks like. Because we don't always have all the pieces aligned correctly just because we live in the Western society. God is a God of all hope, the God of all hope. Hope starts with him, hope continues with him. This is Father's Day, Father's Day, we have a father. I just want to share real quick before I get into what I felt the Lord put on my heart. There's some here that don't have earthly fathers involved with their lives right now. And you're a little confused about what is a father? You have a heavenly father who promised I'll be the father of the fatherless. You have a heavenly father that will watch out for you, provide for you, protect you, and teach you. So draw near to him. I have a word I felt today that the Lord was wanting me to release. It's about the prodigals. God has a word to the fathers in this house that some of your children aren't following the Lord and you're concerned. Your fa the Father has a word for you today. There's a tribe in Africa, I don't know the name, but I know the story. 
When a child is born into the village, they all gather around and they sing a song over that child. That song is unique to that child. Child grows up, they continue to sing that song to remind that child who his family is, who that child is, their identity. Should the child leave the village and go off into life and loses their way, child finds their self back to the village again. But the village doesn't remind that child of what he fell into. They begin to sing that song again over that child to remind him who that child is. Let's go to the prodigal. The prodigal son forgot who he was. He lost his identity. But it says that he came to himself and he said, I'll return to my father's house and be a servant. So he began the journey back home. And it says the father was looking from afar and he saw his son. I believe that every day the father got up and he looked the direction that he last saw his son leave. He was always looking. And when he saw the son, what did he say? My son. The father never lost view of who his son was. Our Heavenly Father never loses sight of who we are. No matter what our children find themselves in, fathers today, your Heavenly Father wants you to know that He's going to bring your children to that same place brought the prodigal. He came to Himself. He remembered who He is. And he left all the entanglements of the world and began that journey back to his father. I declare this today. Fathers, take heart. Fathers, don't give up hope. Because your heavenly father knows who your children are. And he'll bring them back. Take hope. He's the God of all hope. He will do this. So don't lose hope. Continue. Every father that is hearing these words that has a child that has came, went away from the Lord, it's only for a season. It's only for a season. And I want you to begin to prophesy, to begin to declare over them, begin to call them forth by name into their destiny. Call them forth by faith. He who is faithful will do it. So have hope today. Have hope today. God says it's not over. He'll bring them home. He will cause them to come to that place that they come to themselves and remember who they are. God is faithful. Powerful story. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to, everybody, stand to your feet. I want every dad to get in this center of these aisles right here. Every dad, don't leave. Every dad, I want you to get in the center aisle here, this aisle. Every dad, come on. If we get crowded, I want to maybe move up forward, forward here. Every dad, I want to be identified here today. Not in the back. Come on, guys. Not standing in the back. Move up here. I'm gonna pray for each one of these dads here today. And I need you to move out here, even on the older area. We gotta make room. We gotta have a lot of room here. Every dad in the building, I need you up here. Every single dad, okay? All right, now I want you who are in the congregation proper to look at around you. Here you got dads, grandpas right here. I want you to go to one of these fathers, grandpas, okay? Children, come on, I want you to move out. I want, uh, I want uh, grandchildren to move out. I want wives, I want everybody. Everybody's gonna be praying over a grandpa today. 
or a father. Okay, come on, let's find them. Okay, even if there's one person praying for somebody, find somebody. Come on, put your hands on here. All, all, all over up front here. Come on, let's. I'm gonna take the moment. So we got all bases covered here. We're gonna have one humongous prayer meeting here today. We're gonna to be praying for these dads. Every father, every grandfather needs to have somebody praying with them and for them, okay? Anybody overlook? Nobody praying? Okay, gotta have somebody up here. Come on, we got a few more. I need you girls, come up here. Okay, we got a couple up here, a couple fathers, grandfathers. This is very important business here. We're praying with the, we're praying for the people who bear on their shoulders the responsibilities of functional families. Got to tell you, the Bible is very clear on this. That whatever the enemy has meant for destruction in your life, God's going to turn the captivity. I want to pray right now for you. I want to pray for your well-being. I want to pray hope into your life. I want to pray that you'll be honest enough with yourself that you'll own your stuff, okay? And then let's proceed forward and let's have kingdom households, kingdom families, kingdom mindsets, kingdom future. Grace Harbor needs that in this place today. Let's pray. Jesus, your presence has been all over this room. And even in the online service, that is extended beyond the perimeters of this facility. Lord, your presence has been here. We, we, we've gathered in your name and we have sensed your goodness overtaking us. Lord, as we stand in this place today, I especially, want to speak into the hearts of these fathers, these dads here today. A word of faith, a word of hope. Whereas the enemy has sought to beat them down, make them to feel like they are failures and flops in life. Lord, you don't view these guys like that. Lord, you view them as victors, as conquerors, as those who lead in courage. So I want to speak, Lord, over these fathers today, words of hope, because they bear weighty responsibilities. And as they avail themselves to you this morning, I'm asking in Jesus' name, that they will become honest with themselves and deal rightly with issues. And may throughout this week, the Holy Spirit would bring them into a place, a quiet place, where he may speak with them about pertinent matters. And Lord, you will heal their hearts. You'll heal the hearts of these fathers here today. You'll heal their lives of pain, of shortcomings, failures. You'll heal them and you'll give them hope because in a moment you can give a new direction. You can provide a new faith walk trusting you and believing for what you want to accomplish. We'll own our sin. We'll own our iniquity. 
and call it for what it is. And then, Lord, as we embrace you in that manner, we're going to ask you to transform each and every family group. Heal this family. Heal them in Jesus' name. Because only you can change hearts. So we're asking right now, Lord, as you're changing the hearts of the dads in this room and those viewing online, Lord, we're asking that you change the hearts of our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren and turn the captivity. Lord, that these men will have the confidence and the assurance that down the road, their offspring will serve you with all of their hearts. Some of us are further down the road. We may not see the fulfillment of those answered prayers, but you will answer those prayers as we do our part, as we reconcile with you and believe you to transform our family unit, you will change hearts. And we're gonna believe for that this morning in Jesus' name. So I pray favor and blessing over each dad today. Whereas a family unit can experience much, much pain, and the pain is deep. I'm praying today, Lord, that you would overtake these families with joy, with peace, with longevity of purpose, and let the generations unfold of the goodness of God, because we're trusting you in this moment today. Thank you, Jesus, for arresting our dads on Father's Day. Thank you, Father God, for demonstrating to us what fatherhood must look like. And we can trust you in these moments together. We thank you for the family that we experience here today, praying for one another and thus fulfilling the law of Christ. Because your love runs deep in this house. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can anybody say amen? Put your hands together. Thank you, Jesus. Awesome. 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 Okay, fathers and families, we're going to dismiss you in a moment here. And I just want to say, fathers, have a great Father's Day. Wear your cornerstone cap proudly. Remember the house you're representing where you wear this cap, the presence of the Lord and the goodness of God. Go in his favor. Thank you. God bless you. Happy Father's Day.